Tonight we continue our study on the subject of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Tonight we would look, like to look at the work of the Spirit in conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. God has placed in the church certain ministries. Paul declares that, first of all, there were the apostles. And then some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. These are various gifted individuals within the church that God has placed within the body for the purpose of the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Paul declared that he was an apostle, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. He also asked the rhetorical question, are all apostles, are all prophets, do all heal, are all pastor teachers? And the answer is obviously no. There are these many different ministries within the church, but the purpose is the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry the building up of the body of Christ. And so that's really why we're here tonight, to study the word in order that there might be a perfecting of the saints and that you might be edified, built up in Jesus Christ. The Lord wants to bring all of us into a full maturity in our Christian walk. There are too many Christians who have really never developed spiritually. They have what could be classified as a um, arrested state of spiritual development. It began when they were about two months old in the Lord. Paul speaks to them as babes in Christ. He said that he had fed them with the milk of the word and not with meat, for they weren't able to bear the meat and were still not able to take it. The writer to the Hebrews said, For when the time that ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You've become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, milk is a good and proper diet for babies. But there should be a development, there should be a growth in our Christian experience. Paul, I mean, Peter wrote and said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Nothing wrong with that for babies. But the time comes when a child needs to be weaned from the bottle and begin to eat meat. And this is true in a spiritual sense. There needs to be a development, a growth in our walk in the spirit. Paul tells us here in Ephesians 4 that till we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, the word perfect there is fully matured. Until we come into a fully matured state. And what is the mark of that fully matured state? Unto the stature under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
Infancy is a natural state after birth. There's nothing wrong with being a babe in Christ for a while. But when you've been around for 25 years and you're still in diapers and holding on to your bottle, it doesn't take the gift of discernment to understand that something is radically wrong. You should have developed, you should have grown in that time. Now, God has predestined, Paul tells us, that we should be conformed to the image of his Son. In the beginning, we read that God created man, and it declares that he created him in his likeness and after his image. When God said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness, God is a spirit, and thus he was referring to that spiritual aspect of man's being. So that it created in the image of God, God's chief moral characteristic is righteousness, and thus he created us with a desire for righteousness. God's chief governmental characteristic is self-determination. So God created you, a self-determinate being. He gave to you the capacity of choice. God's chief emotional characteristic is love. And he created us with the capacity of giving and receiving love. So we are created in the image of God. A desire for righteousness, the capacity to choose, and the ability to love and to receive love. Now, Man fell from the image of God. He became selfish, cold, indifferent, vengeful. And thus, to understand the real purpose of God in the creation of man, you can't really look around at mankind today and understand God's divine intent in the creation of man. This is a mistake that many people make. They look at fallen man in his fallen state, and then they question the goodness and the love of God that cr would create man, look at him, how horrible he is. The capacities to do so much evil, and... How could a God of love create such a horrible creature as man? You don't see God's intent by looking around at man today because you see man in his fallen state. You don't see what God intended. Now, the Bible describes man in the fallen state. Romans 1.29, Paul said, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure 
in them that do them. Pretty sad state. When you look at it, it it's pretty sad to see the condition of man when he turns his back on God. And it's amazing when a man turns his back on God and the love of God and the things of God, how deep he can go into moral depravity. Paul, in writing the second letter to Timothy, gives him a list. To This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now, when you read that list, I can assure you that was not God's intention for man. That isn't the way that God intended us to live. To know and to understand God's intention for man you have to look at Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, you see the intention of God for man. He lived as God would have us to live. You see, the Bible tells us concerning Jesus that he was... the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So that Jesus came and lived in the image of God and in the likeness of God. In his life, he demonstrated to us what God is like and thus how God created man in his image and how God intended and desires man to live. We read, and the word was made flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul said, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. So you see how God created man when you look at Jesus Christ. He is the image of God. God created man in his image. And so you also see how far man has fallen from the original divine intent of creation. God did not intend that we live as we are living today. God did not intend that man be living after the flesh, soulish, sensual. That isn't God's intention. Jesus said to Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He was and did live in the express image of God. Colossians, Paul said, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, it is God's desire and purpose to take us fallen creatures and to restore us back into his image. God wants to nullify the effect of sin and the fall of man and to restore us once more into the image of God. And so 
Paul said to, in Romans 8, 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live as God intended you to live. Romans 13, 14, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. God does not want us living sensual, fleshly lives. He wants us to live a life in the Spirit and after the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, Paul said, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections, and the lust. Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake? The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked at one time when you lived in them. But now also put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy communication out of your mouth. For you have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So God wants you to put off the old man, the, the old nature, the corrupt nature corrupted by sin. And he wants you to put on the new man. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away and all things become new. Jesus said to Nicodemus, if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. There has to be a new birth, a new man. You put off the old man. By the power of the Spirit, you mortify the deeds of the flesh. No longer living after the flesh, but now living after the Spirit and the things of the Spirit. Now, <laughs> We see the new man in Christ contrasted with the old man after the flesh. And when I see the ideal, I look at Jesus and I read the characteristics and I observe his characteristics. He was kind, he was sensitive. He was compassionate, he was merciful, he was forgiving. And when I see these characteristics, I say, oh, yes, that's how I want to live. I hate it when I get in the flesh and do ugly things. The flesh is so ugly and distasteful. And I desire the ideal. When I le read the contrasting list, I say, oh God, deliver me from the flesh from all of the anger and malice and strife and envy and bitterness and all of those horrible things that just are destroying. God, deliver me from that. I desire 
to be very compassionate, loving, giving, kind. I long to be like Jesus. But as Paul said, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. And that's the problem. How to perform that which is good. Seeing the ideal, desiring the ideal, but the inability to attain the ideal is frustration. That's one of the problems with the religions of the world. Buddha pointed to an ideal. Buddha, in a sense, was on track in many ways. Buddha maintained that man's problems came from his desire for material things. And as long as you were mastered by the desire for material things, you were always going to be upset, angry, warring, filled with strife, because it's this desire to grasp material things. It's sort of the idea that the scripture said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And that lust and desire for money is... Uh, it brings striving, it brings this envying, and it brings jealousies and, and all of these things. And Buddha said, the answer is to lose all desire for things material. And if you can ever achieve and attain that state where you have no desire for material things, even food, that you will then be in nirvana. It'll be peaceful bliss. I'm happy, I'm satisfied. I don't want a thing, you know. And so that to him was nirvana. Now, in a sense, Jesus said, the problem that we have with Anger and all of these things does stem from the material life, the life of the flesh. And so we need to live after the Spirit, and the life of the Spirit is superior to the life of the flesh. And Jesus taught the superiority of the life of the Spirit over the life of the flesh, much as did Buddha. One vast difference. Buddha pointed to the path that would bring you to nirvana, but he had no capacity to help you walk that path. So that just gets frustrating. A few years ago, we had visiting here at Calvary Chapel the king of Laos. And he was here with his cabinet. And we had a large group of Laotian people who had come to meet the king of Laos who had come to Orange County to uh, talk to the Laotian people. I was asked to explain to the king and to his cabinet and to the Laotian people that were here what Christianity was all about. And a beautiful opportunity to share. Now, 
the Laotian people were basically Buddhist. And so, like Paul the Apostle, I started on their turf. <laughs> when Paul was in Athens, he said, I perceive that you're very religious people. I've been going through your city and I found idols, you know, to everything. And I even passed one altar and it was inscribed to the unknown God. I'd like to tell you about this God. <laughs> you know, he's the one that created the heavens and the earth. And, and so Paul started on their turf, but he led them in. So I, I started talking about a lot of the things of Buddha, his teaching, the basic philosophies and, and all of Buddha's teaching. And then I brought out how that it is. He, he taught a good way of life. It would be wonderful if people actually could follow the teaching of Buddha. Would be kind and would be considerate and would be giving and didn't have any desires for themselves. But the problem is that I have never met a Buddhist who could say, well, I'm satisfied. Because none of them had attained nirvana. Because there is something within us, that fleshly nature, that though I may desire it, I see it, I recognize it, Yes, this would be good. This would be wonderful to be able to live like this. To never get angry, to never be upset, to always be in a happy, good frame of mind. Be wonderful. But try as I may, I am still living in this body of flesh and there is this warfare that is going on and I don't always do the things that I would and thus I get upset and frustrated. Now, Jesus said, this is how you're to live after the Spirit. Denying self, the self-life taking up the cross, following him. But then he said, now I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you without any help. I'm going to pray the Father, and he's going to give to you another helper, even the Spirit of truth, that he may abide with you forever. And Jesus promised that when we receive the Spirit, we would, with the Spirit, receive the power of that Holy Spirit dwelling in us, doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to indwell your life and to give you the power to live as God would have you to live. As he dwelling in you, working in you, does his work of conforming you into the image of God. Restoring that which man lost as the result of sin. Restoring man back into the image of God of God. Now, this cannot be done by resolve. It cannot be done by self-effort. Job said, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. David said, oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy commandments. Oh, God, how I wish that this were so, that my ways were directed to keep your commandments. And then he said, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. I see them, I long after them. 
I admit and confess that they are right. I desire them. So my dilemma, I love Jesus. I desire to be like Jesus. I want to be conformed into the image of God. I have a strong desire for these things, but my flesh is weak. And thus, Christians often find themselves in the state of great frustration, having the longing, seeing the ideal, desiring the ideal, but yet defeated so often by the flesh. Must I always live in this condition of spiritual defeat? Thank God, the answer is no. There is true victory for every child of God. When the children of Israel were led by Moses out of Egypt and journeyed through the wilderness to the promised land, their whole experience was an allegory and has parallels in the Christian life. They were saved by the blood of the Lamb that was put on the doorpost of the house. They came out of Egypt, which is a type of the bondage in a life of sin. They came to the Red Sea, which is a symbol of baptism. And they began their journey through the wilderness. towards the promised land. Unfortunately, when they came close to the border and the entering in of the promised land, Moses made the mistake of sending in the spies to spy out the land. And ten came back with an evil report, two came back with an encouraging report. But the people listened to the discouraging report and sought to get a leader to take them back to Egypt. They said, our children will be killed, we'll be destroyed, we can't do it. And God said, because you have failed to enter in, you will wander for 40 years in this wilderness until you've all died and the children whom you said would be a prey, they will go into the land. And so there began a long funeral procession for 40 years as they were waiting for everyone to die off of the old generation. Finally, after 40 years, they came again to the border of the promised land. But this time, having gone around, they came to the River Jordan. And coming through the River Jordan, actually God stopped the river and they came across the Jordan, is a type of that place in your Christian experience where you're tired of wandering in the wilderness, which was marked by complaining and murmuring and just challenging God constantly. They came to Jordan, which is a type of the death of the old nature, the old man. That is the reckoning of my old nature to be dead the mortifying of the deeds of the flesh by the power of the Spirit. And they began to possess what God had promised, a new land, a land that was flowing with milk and honey. 
They had a lot of battles in the wilderness, but they never gained anything from them. Never gained any territory, really. Now, there were still battles, but they were gaining territory all the while. When you come into this life in Christ, the life of the Spirit, there are still battles, there are still struggles. But life, our lives now being directed by the Spirit of God, we are gaining territory all the time as we are laying hold on the promises of God and possessing our possessions, those things that God has promised to us. So, the Holy Spirit has been given to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. I find in my own life a very interesting pattern and though I can observe it, I don't know, I just can't seem to break it. God continues to show me areas of my life that are not yet surrendered to the Spirit. Where the next battle's going to be. You know, we've taken Jericho and Ai and Bethel and we moved, but there's still a lot of territory that isn't yet conquered. And the tragic story of the children of Israel is that they never did conquer all that God gave them. And, and I see those areas in my life, and, and thank God he didn't show them all to me the first week, or I'd have been <laughs> discouraged. But just about the time you think you've arrived, you know, just after a great victory, then the Lord shows you the next place. That area where the flesh still is dominant. And invariably, as the Lord will reveal to me this area where he wants to work, I'll say, oh, Lord, that's horrible. Get out of the way and I'll take care of that right now. I won't do that again. And the Lord lets me flounder in trying to exercise my willpower and my resolve and my strength, and I keep stumbling. And after a period of time, I really began to be almost defeated spiritually because of my inability to conquer this area of the flesh. Until I finally come in utter desperation and hopelessness and say, God, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just can't do it. God, you're going to have to help me. And then the Spirit takes care of it. And I have great victory. And then the Lord shows me the next area, and I say, oh, Lord, get out of the way. I'll take care of this right now. This is horrible. I didn't realize this. I mean, when am I going to learn? But it seems to be a pattern that falls. I have to get to the place of helplessness and confession. Lord, I can't do it. Now, the net result of this is that as he does it, I have no place to boast 
in and of myself. I can't go around, you know, bragging about how I conquered over or I used to do that, but I determined that that was wrong and I didn't do it. See, I, I can't boast. All I can tell you is, man, God can do a wonderful work where I was so weak and has done a beautiful work. And you know, when God does it, so many times it is so beautiful that it's almost unconscious to you. You're not even aware of it until after a period of time and then you realize, wow, I haven't done that for a long time. Man, I don't even want to. Isn't that glorious? You know? And then you realize, oh Lord, you've given me the victory. Oh, bless your name, you know. That's wonderful. We had a fellow here in the church who was a Retired naval officer. And um, through the years in the Navy, he had learned Navy talk. <laughs> and had a real foul tongue. But he came and accepted Jesus Christ here at Calvary Chapel. About six months after Having accepted the Lord here, he was out in his backyard mowing the lawn. Whistling, love, 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 Christian, this is your call. And he wasn't paying close attention, and he went under the tree, but he didn't duck low enough, and the thing caught him right in the forehead, laid him on his back, and his automatic lawnmower just kept going to hit the fence. And as he was lying there on the ground, pain throbbing on his forehead, he jumped up, ran over, turned off the lawnmower, went running into the house and said, Honey, honey, guess what happened? She looked at the big welt rising on his forehead and she said, What did happen, sweetheart? He said, Oh, no, no, not that. He said, it, I, he said I hit a tree, but he said, I didn't cuss. And she said, honey, do you know I haven't heard you use a swear word in six months? He said, I haven't? <laughs> I mean, it was just one of those things. The Spirit does it. You're not even aware of it. But then what rejoicing there is in what God has done. And I think that that's why God so oftentimes lets us try. Let's us struggle. Let's us see our weakness so that we won't go around boasting or bragging when he does it. He lets us get to the place of just hopelessness and, and that recognition of total inability so that when he then does work, we are careful to give him praise and glory, victory through Jesus. Now, Paul writing to the Corinthians said, but we all, with open face, or unveiled face, he was talking about how uh, Moses, when he came down with the law, had to veil his face so that the people didn't see the shining or the fading of the, of the glory that was on his face. But he said, you know, when the Jews read the law today, there's still a veil over their faces. But we, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord. Now that's what, you remember, that's what caused Moses' face to glow, was, was he got a glimpse of God. And, and it, it caused his face to glow. And so we, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord are changed from glory to glory into the same image by the power, he said, of his spirit working in us. So here's the key. As we, with unveiled faces, begin to see the glory of the Lord, 
We begin to worship the Lord. The Spirit of God reveals to us the glory of the eternal God. As we behold that glory, we are being changed. Brought from glory to glory to glory. As we are being molded and changed into his image. By his Spirit that is working in us. And so the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is that of changing you from glory to glory as he brings you into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, God says, basically, these are the laws by which you should live. These are the rules. This is the kind of a person you ought to be. These are the things you should be doing, and these are the things you should not be doing. And if you do these things, you will have a rich, full life in fellowship with me. And I say, good. I love it. I want it. I agree. That is a good life. And I will live that way. And then I immediately discover that there is another law that is working in me that is fighting against the law of my spirit. Now, God's law is good. I consent to the law of God that it is good but how to perform the law, how to do what is right, how to keep the ideal, I don't know. And that's the problem. I need the power of the Holy Spirit because I just can't do it myself. So Paul then concludes in Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do, it, it, it was no fault with the law. The law is good. It's right. It's holy. I mean, it, it, it's the right way. But what the law could not do, what could the law not do? It could not give me the power to keep it. You see, I was still weak. I'm still me. So though the law is good, and I consent the law is good, the law cannot give me the power to keep it. It can only point an accusing finger at me when I'm not keeping it. So the law could not make me righteous. It could only condemn me. So what the law could not do in that it was weak through my flesh, that was the weak part of the chain, my flesh, that's, that's where the whole thing broke down. The law is good. My flesh is rotten. My flesh is weak. So, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. And then his son sent me the Holy Spirit and through the Spirit the power to live a life of victory over the baser desires of my flesh. I have received power through the Holy Spirit to be what God wants me to be, to do what God wants me to do. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I am being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I would be less than honest if I told you his job was finished. There's still a long way to go. But as the fellow said, 
I'm not yet what I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I was. I'm on the way, and I'm experiencing in one area of my life after another the power of the Holy Spirit empowering me, changing me, transforming me into the image of Jesus Christ. I'm growing. Beware when you get to a place of becoming stagnant, when you can't see any growth. And be doubly aware and concerned when you can look back and see a time when you were closer to the ideal than you are today. That's bad. See, I haven't arrived, but I'm closer today than I've ever been. And I have this confidence that he who has begun a good work in me is going to complete it. He doesn't start anything. He doesn't finish. And so it is important for me that I remain yielded to the Holy Spirit and that I receive that power of the Holy Spirit, that power of the Spirit whereby I mortify the deeds of the flesh, that power of the Holy Spirit whereby I am transformed into the image of Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for that work of your Holy Spirit in us, Oh, Lord, how grateful we are for all that you've done. Lord, when we see what we are today and we remember what we were, oh, Lord, we've come so far and we are so thankful. And Lord, as David, we ask that you would continue your work and search us, oh, God, and know our hearts. Try us, know our thoughts. See if there's some place of wickedness that is there still. And Lord, continue to lead us in your path of righteousness. Continue, Lord, to conform us into the image of God through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, hold o'er my being. Absolute sway, fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Grant. Father, the prayer of our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. If you want, there's a group meeting over in the fellowship hall to wait upon the Lord. If you need prayer, go back to the prayer room. The elders will be back there to minister to you tonight. God bless you.